You there, Craig? Yeah, I am. Let's go ahead and get this baby started with our feature presentation. <laughs> Well, welcome, welcome everybody to episode 14 of the podcast. How do you know that with Robert Hollis? And you know, we are so glad to have you with us today. Before we get things going, if you are watching us on YouTube, please hit the like and share buttons as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. Very simple. Hit the subscribe button and then hit the bell next to the subscribe button so that you get notified when we do broadcasts like this and others that we uh, do on a daily basis. And if you are listening to us elsewhere in the podcast universe, please like and share this with friends and help us spread the word. Uh, also, if you'd like to join our exclusive community, the inner circle, you can join us by going to roberthollis.com forward slash join to register. There will be lots of great exclusive content and you'll be able to participate in our special breakthrough sessions to help you move on to the next level. Today is, <coughs> excuse me, today is episode 14 of How Do You Know That? And we will be interviewing a very special guest the son of Robert Hollis, Matthew Hollis, who is an incredible person himself. And you're going to find out more as we continue with today's podcast. Now, allow me to introduce our host of today's show. He is an entrepreneurial evangelist, renowned for his incredible achievements. He is also known for inspiring countless of individuals around the world with his unwavering determination and spirit and he has also helped 67 people, as of this date, become millionaires. Known as a mentor, GPS to success, and a dear friend, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Holly! Thank you so much, Hostess with the Mostess, and, and welcome to uh, another episode of uh, our podcast. And uh, yeah, this is going to be a very special time. So Craig, thank you so much for everything that you do. And uh, today, uh, um, yeah, I, I, it's going to be difficult because I, I, I just admire this man so much. Not that he's just my son, but uh, every time I think of him, he's been a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, I'm very proud of him, of who not only he is, but the kind of... Uh, a uh, husband that he is, the kind of man that he is, the way he treats people, and his constant uh, his constant willingness to be able to not only learn but also help other people uh, get where they need to go. So I'm very, very, very proud of my son Matthew Hollis. So Matthew, <laughs> thanks for coming on here. Of course, yeah. Well, thank you. That's quite the introduction, you know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I. It's interesting because you asked me before I got on here if I was nervous. And it's it's funny because once the, the live started, then there was like this nervousness that crept out. I was like, wait a minute. What what is that? But, <laughs> so but, so you, you, you still get nervous from time to time. I do. Yeah. I mean, I think it it's, tends to be like I've gotten so much better at like the pre stuff because like the pre stuff used to always be like my anxiety nervous driven. And then I would get into the situation and then it would like slowly dissipate. And I feel like now I've gotten better at just being like more go with the flow and just if if it doesn't go a certain way or things don't go my way in specific, I'm just kind of fine with it. So it's like I think the nervousness now just comes from like the excitement. It's like an excited nervousness because I I'm interested to see what you guys have to. <laughs> it's like, it's like, uh, yeah, I mean, that's something that I think would be really, really interesting for people to know as uh, Craig and, and uh, you and I have all done, decided to do these podcasts is that, you know, I I'm, I'm sure in a lot of, a lot of podcasts or shows, you know, you get, you know, a list of questions that need to be asked. You also get to prepare for those questions. And, you know, uh, I'll be the third one, but I, I think it was pretty interesting how we jumped on with Craig and and we just are who we are. I, right. I, I, think, I think being who we are and allowing the conversation to just be part of the conversation without having a preset, what we're going to do? What are we trying to do? Are we trying to close somebody? Are we trying to get them <laughs> to do something? And uh, I, I just love that. So I want everyone to know that there was no preparation in this whatsoever. It was us coming up with ideas to do podcasts. And um, Craig was probably the person or Matt, 
not I, that went, why don't we interview each other? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know who came up with that bright idea, but it, it, it's pretty, pretty cool. So um, <laughs> may, may, maybe it's I a crazy... I'm pointing in the right direction on the video, but it yes. says Matt. Mr. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I, I, and uh, oh, by the way, thank you so much, James Saunders, for being you, uh, a, a super chatter. Um, already bringing in $50 for, for, you know what? I never even thought about this. As we go through here, let's allow all the super chats that come in today to, to, to actually go to Matthew and Hannah and allow them to be able to donate it to whoever they want to. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. You know, then it's going to St. Jude. So. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so what we can do that Great organization and, and, and that's well, the one and, I always do. Yeah. And so it's so. fair. So it's fair. Well, I, let's go back and look at Craig's and anybody that donated <laughs> there will make sure that Craig, uh, you know, gets that money. So, um, so Matt, I, I'll start out with the first question. Uh, um, sure. So what someone was going to say, you know, who is Matthew Hollis? Who is mm -hmm. he and what, what, what's he about? What, what, how do you answer that? It's, it's an interesting question because like, it's a question I ask myself. <laughs> so it's, it's like not, it's not like a, an abnormal question. I think it's good to continue to ask yourself who you are. Yeah. And nowadays I would just say that I'm, I don't know, I'm a constant human in progress. I'm somebody that's, that's driven to learn. I, I feel, feel like I've always been creative and like idealistic. I, I tend to bounce between pessimist and optimist from time to time too which i think is normal but um right now i'm i'm very optimistic i'm optimistic about the future i'm optimistic about what what we're accomplishing here i'm optimistic about what i'm accomplishing myself and i think um if i had to describe myself i would just say like a constant learner i think I, that's more than anything um i'd love to be a philosopher one day of some kind wow. like i I, I tend to enjoy thinking about different topics and talking and collaborating with people and those things. And that's why this podcast works so well. So. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I know that people, if you wanted to, uh, uh, especially for our super chatters and in our inner circle, if you guys had some questions that we wanted to throw Matt's way. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I think that would be really, really cool. So, Craig, what, what what's your opening question to Matt? Well, you know, one thing I love is... Okay, ever since I first met Matt years ago, uh, I noticed he was, you know, a, kind of a little lanky, a little shy, uh, <laughs> especially when, you know, I, I know that a lot of the uh, attention, Robert, was around you. But I've noticed over the years that, Matt, you have opened up. You have Thank you. become more, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way, okay? I mean that in a very, very positive way because you have be become more... Um, I'm not, I don't mean vocal in this, in the, in the, the wrong way here. Y you've, you become to show people who you are and not right. just your father's son, the way right. I see it. You, you've become very open. You, you, you're very willing to share with people and it, it's great to see also a little bit of Robert rub off on you. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Now. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who'd have thought? <laughs> Who'd have thought? And it, it it's a great it's a great view. I'm so happy to have seen this. How do you feel that you've uh, grown over the last couple of years? Well, I think there's been certain situations that have like really challenged me to figure out. Going back to even my dad's question of like, who am I? Um, I think early on there was a. There's one thing that me and my dad share in common, I think, that um, is very unique to me and him that we can talk about. And, and I think we both have like an extreme level of like creative, creative optimism about certain things that we can talk about and that we can do. And so I think that that's something that we've always communicated about, even since I was a little kid. I think as far as being open about who I am as a person and like sharing it, that just comes from like self-confidence in who I am. Um, and I, to be honest, like anybody that's on here, that's, you know, I'm 31. Um, when people say to you, Hey, you become more confident when you get older, it's somewhat true. And I think that that's, that just comes from just like understanding the world a little bit more wisdom, right? Going, okay. Like I'm more, uh, relaxed with who I am now, 
now being publicly relaxed with who I am because I tend to be a very private person. It's funny even getting a picture for this graph or for the graphic for the thumbnail. because It's like a <laughs> couple year old photo because I'm like, when's the last time I posted a picture of myself on social media? And it's not because I feel like not good about myself or something like that. I just am not one of those people to I'm very private, right? Like I tend to be very private. But when it comes to like sharing my opinions and my thoughts, I think my dad would be the first one to say that that's not a new thing for me. It just, it's, it's new in public, but it, it's never, it's mm -hmm. always been part of my personality to be that way. So yeah, I, I guess I don't know of another, um, I, I mean, obviously being married has changed me probably the most drastically out of anything in life, like falling in love and, and having somebody that consistently is pushing me to grow in like very personal areas outside of my family. Um, because, you know, my family, they're with me. They're going to like love me regardless of who I am. That's just who they are. Um, but, you know, Hannah, my incredible wife, she's she's somebody that loves me for like who I am. Right. And having her support and stuff in me being myself and being more open about who I am and my opinions on things has helped, too, because it's like when I have the backing of like my closest friends, my incredible family and my amazing wife, it's like it's pretty easy to to be like optimistic and, and speak my mind. So <clears throat> I'm fortunate with that. I'm very lucky, by the yeah. way. Um, so are all of us, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I So you've been married to Hannah coming up on nine years? Yeah, nine years in November. <laughs> oh, my God. Since um, I was 22. I, so I, I, I think uh, I, I think that's a, probably a quick story that you could tell about yeah. you know, how you and Hannah met. And and uh, in my in me and mom's opinion, you know, is like a fairy tale. Uh, it is. Yeah, it, we have yeah. such a weird, uh, it, you know, me and Hannah's story is like one of those ones where people get angry almost because it's like, I wish that situation <laughs> would happen to me. Right. So like we. My dad had hired somebody to work with us, and this is Hannah's father, to work with us to build out a company that we used to have called Unlimited Profits. And in that company, Hannah had worked with her dad, and I had worked with my dad, and this was when we were young. She was 19, 18, even younger at the time. She had worked, I think 17 is even when she yeah. started. And through that, there was certain situations where she she would reach out to me and be like, congratulations on the nephew that you got because, you know, my nephew Ryder was born. Um, and so we started communicating through Facebook that way and just started talking like every single day. Right. Um, but the we kind of lost talk, contact for a little while outside of just like, oh, congratulations on an accomplishment or something. It never was really like flirtatious or dating or anything like that, right? And then she had her birthday, her 19th birthday happened. Um, and she started one of those Facebook charities to donate to, I believe it was, uh, it was um, not Habitat for Humanity. It was one of those uh, charities hydrating humanity. It was like they build water wells in Africa, right? And so I just took a like the the decent amount of money that I some of the money that I had saved and I just gave like the whole amount because I knew she'd have to reach out to me and say <laughs> say good. I'm like even if she didn't, it's still going to a good cause, right? Right. But like if if she uh, <laughs> if she's reaches out to me, she's also seeing that I have like a passionate side to me. That is the same stuff I get that from my dad parents too. That like giving part. So. After that, it was like we just were started talking every single day and and started Skyping. Eventually, I went out to visit her and her family in North Carolina. And a uh, month later, we were all flying to Las Vegas and we were married. So it's interesting because we have that story where not only were we married, we were dating for a month before we got married. We got married in Las Vegas and now we're coming up on being married for nine years. So, OK, I got to ask this question. <laughs> this is going to yeah. this is going to open up a lot of them. The when you got married with Hannah, was that the same weekend that we had the event out in uh, yep. Red Rock? I yep. did not know this. <laughs> yep. So like it, it was like a, a something that we had decided before we got there. 
thank you so much for the donation, Elijah. But um, before we got there, we were already deciding on it because after the four days I went to go visit her, um, that just like solidified the love because we that we already had. I was we were talking to each other all day, every day, like mm -hmm. basically all the time, whether we, if we weren't working on something or busy, um, we were talking to each other. So I we like fast tracked our relationship in a way, I feel like, because instead of doing the whole let's go out on a date and then we'll go out on another date, we were just talking all the time about everything. And so she really is my best friend and like falling in love with her through that path of her being my best friend. <clears throat> that's always stayed the case. Like I we hang out every single day and, and have a lot of similarities and stuff. But even the things that we have different than one another um you know hannah's made me such a more emotional person and understanding person of other people you know because i think the analytical side that my dad saw me grow up my own mind right mm -hmm. um i was very analytical and i was very combative and i think now i'm so much more empathetic empathetic and i think it took hannah to push me to that place my dad and mom really couldn't get me there right right um so it was falling in love and I'll never forget, you know, like uh, one of the times that my dad, you know, one of the few times he turned out to be right. Right. <laughs> but uh, was was when he was like, you know, one day you're going to meet somebody that you fall in love with and you're not going to be able to make sense of it scientifically or analytically. And that will be the first moment that you re your brain really checks out of being so methodical about every how everything's supposed to work. Right. Because before okay, I was if like, it, if it's all up here and she's not around me, why does my heart hurt? Right. Why, why, why is there? Why, why do I have this awful knot in my stomach? <laughs> right. And I need Butterfly to logically, feeling. I need to logically make my heart and my stomach start, stop hurting. Uh, <laughs> and I was saying, Matt, when that happens to you, when, she decides to go someplace and you're not around her and you're like, I need her. I, I, I need to get <laughs> around her. And I go, right. Yeah. And when you can't stop thinking about her. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I mean, that's still, that's still the case. You know, like I, <laughs> I think, I think that is one of the, you know, and with anything, it's funny when, whenever someone asked me and Hannah, cause we got married really young, right? I was 22 and she was 19, um, which, in our generation is like unheard of, right? Like in older generations, it was more common, but nowadays most people get married when they're 30, right? Um, at or least dated after millennial. or married after like two years of dating or something like right, that. Right, yeah, definitely not after a month. Most marriages that are in their 20s and right away normally are like the Britney Spears situation where it's like, <laughs> yeah. wash my hands of it a month later. But I, it, it, it really has always even though it's been, you know, one of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me, it's challenged me a lot because me and Hannah being married young, um, we've, we've had to grow up like together. Yeah. Right. And that has bonded us in such a way too, because both of us kind of came from similar upbringings in the sense that we're, we were both homeschooled. Hannah did her last two years in, in high school. Um, but the rest of it, she was homeschooled. I was homeschooled my whole education. So I think when it, you meet somebody else that's been homeschooled, there's kind of like a homeschooler, like fist bump, like, Oh yeah, there's another one of you, you know, because yeah, it's just I, a different I, experience. Right. So for you guys, for you guys to understand this uh, from, from, from um, a father's point of view. Right. Uh, I don't know any of this connectings happening behind the scenes. Right. <laughs> and so it, it's funny. He, he uh, one day Matt said, uh, you know, I, I want to have a, a serious talk with you. And I'm like, you know, what, what's, this, what's going on? And and uh, we went for a walk and he's going, um, you know, here's someone that's I, I can't even remember if Matt up to this point in his life even asked to borrow the car to go someplace by himself. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if that even happened. And, and, uh, no, I, I always see like the thing about me not interrupt you is that like le leading up to meeting Han Hannah, not only was I very like a homebody pretty completely, like very, uh, technology playing video games, yeah. working on the internet, like, uh, doing 
graphic design and all that type of stuff, right? So I was very much like in my room beforehand. So it really, uh, yeah, no, you're right. You know, like I, it, it was, <laughs> so, it was like a drastic change in who I was for sure. Yeah, and so all of a sudden, I said, "Well, let, let, let's go for a walk." And and I'm walking with him, and he all of a sudden he says, uh, "He says, uh, Dad, I, I'm I'm gonna get a, a, a airplane ticket, and I'm flying to." Charlotte to to meet this girl that I I, I love, and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was like, and he's going, yeah. And I just honestly, that's when we had that conversation. Is right. um, you know, when when you when you love somebody or you're passionate and you love to do stuff, that's why other people can't understand your journey. Yeah, they're not only not going to yeah. understand your journey, they don't understand anything about it. So Terry and I had not met Hannah. All right. right. So then Matt goes out, spends some time with Hannah and, and their family. And then he comes back and he's going, uh, you know, we were going to the Eric Worre event. And, mm -hmm. and uh, when we went to the Eric Worre event, um, I decided to, uh, and I don't know, I'm sure Matt is, is such a, a master at this stuff is I don't know why I all of a sudden said that, not only was I going to bring Hannah's parents, but Hannah, I was going to fly their, out, them out there for this event. And then Matt and, and, and my wife, Terry, goes out to the event. So we go out there and they're all flying in. Their flight was a little later. And um, we're standing in the lobby of this hotel where we got all the room. And when Matt and Hannah seen each other, it was a scene out of a movie. Uh, they not <laughs> really, like yelled at each other. And then they ran to each other. Matt started spinning her around and her, <laughs> her purse and her water bottle and, and everything fell. And uh, is and where where's all of the parents are standing there looking at him. As soon as he gets done, you know, twirling and they kiss, then Matt gets down on one knee. And we're like going, what the fuck? Is going on? <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and and uh, so then they come up to us. You know, we're seeing it happen. Of course, he said yes. And then Matt and Hannah say, yeah, we're going to go to the courthouse and we're going to get married. And it's like, uh, which is funny to, to add to this. Um, <laughs> it's like, you cannot what? get married in Las Vegas at a courthouse. We learned you have to go to one of those chapels. That's part ah, of the law in Las that's Vegas. That's the way they do their like business. So stuff. we we didn't do we didn't do the Elvis wedding, all right? Because neither mm -hmm. one of us are like Elvis fans, right? <laughs> Sorry, it's not. Um so so since that's the case, we just went to this um little chapel, right? And so Hannah's family's there, my family's there, everybody but my younger brother Kyle and you know, my grandparent, my grandma, but we're, so we have the whole family there, basically. And we walk in to get married with this guy, right? And he's going to marry us. We're dressed. I had a suit on. She had a dress on. Of course, my dad and everybody else was dressed up because they had the Eric Worre event they're going to. So it's like, great. Everyone's already going to be dressed anyway. So we go in. And while we're, when we're talking to this guy, he's like not only surprised about how much we're like excited about it. But at the same time, he's like, these people are sober. They're like getting married sober. Here. Like, Holy <laughs> shit. You know what I mean? So and then, and then we I'll have, never forget. That was funny. Yeah, then we have this uh, wedding, right? And, right. you know, everybody's pretty stunned. It, 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 it was uh, incredibly exciting for me. And, and, and I know Terry feels the same way. And we're just really, really excited. First time they've ever met Hannah, by the way. They hadn't met her in person. Never met her. Wow. Never met her. And so... It was funny. So now they're married and now we're walking out of the a chapel all, 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 all everywhere. I'm congratulating him and, and getting to meet Hannah and stuff. And then I'm not thinking ahead. You know what I mean? And Matt's going, um, oh, now that Hannah's my wife, she already packed her bags. They're here. Can she fly home with us? And I'm like, <laughs> what? What the hell? What's going on here? <laughs> Of course, she's not <laughs> flying back home. You don't get no, married yeah, and, then, and then move apart. So well, also too, also too, Hannah's Hannah's family um, was and still is like pretty religious too. 
Um, so very, like very, there's very a certain respect, very yeah. religious and very, there's strict. this, right. There's a certain level of respect that I had for the process too, on her side, you know, like I think looking back on it, we both agree that we probably would have dated and not gotten married as quick too. But at the same time, it was like, we just felt the way that we felt about one another. And that's still the same. So it's like, um, why not? What are we waiting for? <laughs> and I don't, it's not like, uh, for most people it's, it's, it's nuts. And I get to like, we're incredibly lucky to have found one another in the way that we did. And still nine years later to still be together and still be each other's best friends. That's another lucky element. So yeah. it's like, I think yeah. as we've gotten older and older now, you know, now we're talking more about, okay, like kids, family, that type of stuff. And we're getting into that part of our lives now, which is great. Cause when we finally do have children, we'll have already had that decade together, which is really, really cool. The, other, the so. other funny part about the whole scenario from my point of view too, is, uh, is okay. So we just watched them get married. Right. And so Matt is like, Hey, can she come back with us? You know, we'll get <laughs> things squared away. And I thought it was really funny because then all of a sudden Hannah in front of her parents, right. Go, I'll go get all this stuff out of my room because I'm going to be staying tonight with my husband. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Listen, they were more, they were more aware of, of, of everything. Not that I hid anything from my parents. I think more than anything, my, uh, my mom was more tuned in to the whole entire thing, but that's just the way that it is. So like, I think, um, the, the whole, uh, you know, it was interesting because we we came back to Montana after that. And then she spent Christmas with us in my parents' house, which was an interesting experience because she barely knew them, you know. And um, so everyone's kind of getting to know Hannah. Uh, Hannah's trying to get to know everybody else. And then finally, we we were able to find an apartment of our own and move out like that January and uh, kind of have like our, our honeymoon period where it was just me and Hannah. But <laughs> <laughs> but it was definitely a, a, a like you tell people that story and people are like, I've never heard anything like that before. That's and, I mean, and, that's interesting. Yeah. Jerome so. Marshall is saying in the chat, y'all should make a movie. And I kind of agree. This is, uh, <laughs> all the elements I, I, that are I, here are incredible. Trust me, there's more elements that make it even more movie like, but uh, I'm not going to share them here. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things, uh, one of the things I, I think that a lot of people will, would like to know too is, uh, you know, your your perspective. If I was nervous about anything, it's this part. Is is I wanted to ask you, um, you know, if someone was asking you, you know, what was your childhood? You know, what was your mm -hmm. childhood? Uh, you know. Um, you know, as a father, I, I, I brag about not only how creative you are at a very, very young age, but also I'm still extremely proud of, you know, your mixed martial arts, uh, yeah. being, being a black belt and, and, uh, a cookie one black belt in Taekwondo. It's like, I, 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 I love that part of your story, but from your part of your story, <laughs> you know, in your childhood, mm -hmm. you know, what, what do you, what do you think? What do you think of part of your childhood, good and bad, that that made you who you are today? Well, you know, we could, I think as far as, it's funny you asking me this question because you're my parent. But yeah, it is I a good, know. It is a like, good Okay, so a good I'm going to hold my ears. <laughs> I'll start and... with the bad and you can plug <laughs> your ears and then, no. You know, me and my dad are really honest. And as I've gotten older, we've had so many conversations about stuff and then like I've, I think we see each other from um, each other's perspective so much better now. But oh, I think yeah. of like anything bad from my childhood, I think it more more than anything, like uh, I, I don't know, the homeschooling aspect of my childhood kind of like crippled me until I was in martial arts. Right. And I'm so glad I did because I just it made me more of like a a socially anxious person. And this is something that, that a lot of homeschool kids can relate with because you're not like forced into a situation where you have to like figure it out um, until you're older. The, and I had friends, you know, it's not like I didn't get out or I always was in the house, but I was pretty in the house, dad, you could admit. <laughs> so 
I think even though I'm more extroverted now, um, it took me a while to like figure out how to be better of a collaborator with people. Cause like, I think one thing that you get from homeschooling too, is like, I have a lot of self-confidence, I guess. And I think people tend to think that as a benefit, but it can be, it can also be ego. Like I, in almost every situation that I was in with people of my same age, I never felt like we were on the same level. And that's a, a mean thing to think. That's an egotistical thing to think. Um, where I'm going, you know, I I felt more educated. I felt smarter than them because I kind of education in my situation was so much more important to who I was. It wasn't like a requirement. It was more of something that I saw as a building block to who I was as a person. And it also was like something that I really like held in high esteem for myself, right? Like I was always like so well read. I'm 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 more educated, right? Like that type of stuff, but it just alienated me because I realized um, that I was an asshole in those situations, right? I know it all in a sense. And I wasn't opening myself up to like learning from other people. So I think as far as bad things go, it took me a while, probably like half of my 20s to figure that out, <laughs> right? To figure out that I needed to, um, that I needed to be that way, that I needed to like actually support and listen to people and be more emotional with people and not so heavy headed with them um, and be more collaborative with people. Right. Because like there's certain, I, the sport that I was in, there are certain aspects of it that were team, but it's mostly individual. So uh, not only was I homeschooled, but then I was also in an individual sport and the sport that I was in, I was really good at. So there was also that confidence boost of just being like, okay, like I'm, I'm kind of like the hot shit in a sense. <laughs> and this is just part of my personality. Like back then I was more brag braggadocious, if that's even a word. Mm -hmm. And because of that whole situation, um, it just took, it, I had a lot of combative relationships, even with my close friends that I still have now that we laugh about. Cause it's like, man, why was I such an asshole for no reason? You know, one of the one of the things uh, I'm just going to throw in there as I heard your perspective on that, I wanted you to be open and honest. And yeah. one of the things that I think that you could say that you thought it was maybe on your upbringing and and homeschooling. But I think a lot of people that are watching this, watching this, know a lot of teenagers, even maybe their self, that there was a point in their life where they knew everything and I'm dead. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, like, like I had, I had the grace. <laughs> yeah, no, grace you're right. Through public school. Oh God. And, yes. And there's this day that you wake up and you are the smartest person in your house. Right. Well, you, I, you, I, you really are. <laughs> and you consistently yeah. think that way too for a long True. period of time. He's like, no. I got the knowledge. <laughs> Me and, and my, then, you know, me and my and dad had a lot of your, combative. You, you wasn't going to your school. It was just me and your mother. Right. But, but when me and Craig figured out that we knew everything and that we were assholes, <laughs> it was like that was the same time that we realized, and maybe for some other listeners, is that we were really smarter than anybody in our school, including our teachers. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, funny. It might be just something that you got to figure out for your identity sure. uh, to just to just figure out in your own mind, you know, if you actually bring something to the table. You know what I mean? If you're, you know, because you're trying to find your uniqueness. I don't know. Right. In different ages of when this happens to people. But what you're trying to do is you're not trying to be a sheeple. You know, you're, you're trying to be. Well, you know, that I think that that's. The reason that certain styles of music and certain things are more popular with younger people, you know, wow. like I think when you're in that in that set space, you know, I grew up um, I'm 31. So I grew up with like uh, uh, Green Day and like My Chemical Romance. And I went through my like emo phase. Right. Uh, my long haired skater boy phase. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm kind of going through that again. But hey. <laughs> But it's like uh, I, I absolutely felt that way. And I had I, I think in my own mind, I had a uh, a leg up. Right. Because I was really educated by the Internet in so many ways. And this is something that 
other generations didn't have the benefit of. Like right. I was, I was like right there on the on the uh, beginning of social media and the World Wide Web as we know it in the way that it is now as an education platform. So I've always gone to YouTube and to Google to learn things. And so it, it becomes such second nature that then I'm like, and I also am really good at retaining information for some reason. So like, I, you're welcome. I will have you're, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. So <laughs> like I, it's definitely good for being tested. But like, I, I think with that, you, you know, there's a, there's a certain aspect of know-it-all that happens, especially when you're like into history or when you're into other things like I am. Um, where you're going, oh, well, actually, this has happened before, or like, this is this, or this is that. And I think I used to, when I was younger, lean a lot more into politics, too, where, like, I thought, um, like, a lot of young people do, and this isn't a mistake. I think this is a good thing, but that you can change the world if only you're vocal enough. And, um, you know, in my wisdom, as I've gotten older, I've learned that that's not completely true, that you actually have to have something that you're saying and that you're standing for that's important and good you can't just be yelling you know that's not enough <laughs> and i think both of you guys are probably like yeah maybe we went through the similar phase of that <laughs> but you know you can be angry but if you don't have a solution to your anger then what's the point you know why why are you so angry and i think that that's something that it took me a while to learn but you know i think as far as the positives go it's, it's almost like the same stuff right so for my upbringing, I was always in a situation where I had the ability to use certain pieces of technology. My dad was really into computers growing up. So I always had compu a computer around that I could play with. Um, I, I My dad shared this story a few times through the podcast and other things, but I've, I've been reading like my whole life as long as I can remember. So I think that that's something that um, definitely changed who I was growing up. Uh, just my avid ability to like read and, and digest topics and certain things. So all of that kind of came from, I think, a lack of a lot of standardized testing. Yeah. Truthfully, I think without consistent standardized tests that I would have been getting constantly in school, uh, there really was no like uh, barrier to what I could learn. And I loved learning. And since you know, my social life outside of playing video games and martial arts, I didn't really have one. It was like just a really, I'll just learn as much as I can about so many different topics and stuff. And so like, that's the benefit, right? Is that everything that you see me here now as is like the culmination of um, that support from my parents, that support of you want to learn this thing, do it. Um, if you want, if you have this idea, go for it. You know, like I think my dad likes to play contrarian to my ideas sometimes <laughs> to challenge me, which when I was younger, we would just get in arguments about it because we both loved that back then. We would just argue. Mm -hmm. um, but now, now, like I can see it more as like a reflection on um, open thinking, you know, yeah. like I think more now um, it's good to pinpoint not just an idea, but like, uh the negative of that or the opposite of that idea and and hearing that out and seeing that perspective you know like i am it, here's another thing that will really blow people's minds i'm sure because i saw some people say um li living the biblical truth because of the way me and hannah got married i when me and hannah got married i was an atheist so my dad believes believer all, all that stuff. I wasn't raised in a household without those things, although they weren't like forced upon me in an extreme way. Like we went to church and stuff, but um, it just wasn't right. Like my dad was a firm believer of you believe and think the way you want. And so um, because of that, you know, I meet Hannah and Hannah is religious. And so there's that whole element of our relationship and stuff. And I think as I've gotten older, I've become, I'm definitely not like uh, a specific religion, but I definitely am more spiritual now than I was when I was younger. I was pretty much 0% spiritual when I was younger, but, 
But yeah. I think that came comes from the same analytical, like everything needs to be processed and understood, right? Like I was one of those kids that sat and watched the science channel all the time. So like I, I was always one of those people that's like, uh, if you can prove it, then, then great, I'll believe it. If you can't, then I'm not going to. And I think after the whole love situation that I shared earlier, it's really changed my perspective on life because I can't understand how that works. So I don't have any children yet, so I can only imagine what that's oh, going to do to me. <laughs> you, you got you got one of them that's walking in the background. I know. I might have to run and just put Rue in the crate real quick because she's okay. just at my legs and they're playing. But if you want to just say something quick, I can all have my headphones they're on. Not, and hear they're it. not bothering us. No, they're no, fine. they're bothering they're bothering me. She's. <laughs> um, I have a I have a seven month old corgi puppy. I'll pull her up right now. This is her. It's Rue. Hi, Rue. And and she is just finishing her first like and there's heat. Milo. So I need Milo chases her around everywhere and I can't have that. So Okay. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask you a quick question, Robert. Sure. How has it been watching Matt grow up, especially these last few years, and working with him more closely? Well, watching all of my sons just evolve. You know, just evolve and and uh you know, it's uh, I think it's very, very difficult for a parent to watch your children um, do things where you know that they're going to learn lessons from. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, that's one of the things now being 61 is that when I see Matthew, um, you know, figuring out who he is and knowing that um if he needs my opinion, he'll ask for it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, but, uh, you know, that's such a great perspective, dad, too. Yeah. I'll, I'd and, love and to speak so, on that. Yeah. And so, you know, there was, there was times where I just feel like, you know, and it, it was funny because since Matt could talk, you know, where I was debating a change in his name from Matthew to debater. Uh, <laughs> so, so he's just got that personality and so it wouldn't make a difference what we're doing. It, it could be, you know, what we're going to have to eat, uh, what we're, what show we're going to go to, um, what we're going to watch on TV. Uh, it didn't make a difference what it was. Matt was immediately debating on what, you know, he, he was either debating or he was negotiating. And, and, yeah. uh, and I just, and he's, that's part of who he is as part of his personality. And, and I, I, I love that about him because he, he, uh, he, he'll get a group of people that will sit at the house all day and he will get them to go do something. You know what I mean? He, he, he's a, he's a constantly person to give you uh, all the reasons that, that that you could benefit your life by <laughs> by doing something that you don't want to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I I mean that's that's one of those elements too of my personality that's definitely like uh, changed a lot over my older years, right? <laughs> like you listen, you get married, and and my wife is um, half Sicilian, half Puerto Rican, so <laughs> you get you get married to. <laughs> A strong woman like that right and she uh you know she doesn't take my shit in any way which i love <laughs> right like i love that about her and i love that about our relationship because i've seen that in my parents relationship i, I was just gonna say you know? i see that a lot with robert and terry you know right. terry loves robert but <laughs> there there but is if, a point if, <laughs> and i seen that when i was growing up if if um my mom disagreed with something she never felt like she couldn't vocalize that she disagreed right. with my dad. Yeah. Right. And, and that's how I grow up in a household it. like that. Right. Yeah, no, Terry's got such a strong personality, but it's a good strong and it's, it's, mm -hmm. she will stand up for herself as much as it sounds like Hannah stands up for herself with you. Right. No. Yeah, no, same. And so like, I think as I've gotten older, um, it really, it really changed like uh, how, much I needed things to be in my control. Like another part of my story leading up to this point is like, um, I don't know, I'll share one quick, one quick part of like my experience. Uh, one of the things that I experienced a lot when I was in my teenage years was like extreme levels of like rumination in my mind and compulsive thoughts. 
and I tried to hide these things from my family because um, I just thought I was weird, right? I was uh, really weird, like washing my hands a bunch, counting things, doing all different kinds of shit that I just felt was weird, right? And then um, because of my love for movies, which is another part of my story, uh, I saw Martin Scorsese's The Aviator about Howard Hughes. And this was like in 2008 or something like that. And I see this movie and I'm watching this character do things that I do. And I'm going, what the hell is that, right? Turns out it's obsessive compulsive disorder, right? And for the longest time, I've been making sure there's no germs, washing my hands, having to do all these things and understanding that part of myself growing older and, and seeing it more as like a superpower, kind of like my dad says with dyslexia or, or something like that, you know, something that in a way has challenged my, me in certain areas has been a great superpower in my uh, ability to be, like stay on a subject to its completion or like actually like really pick up and learn things because I'm very focused on it. Um, you know, Bob asked this question real quick. Do you ever feel like you ever wanted to school when you were homeschooled? I did. I did. And we had talked about it. And I think one of the things that is different about our story in specific and mine is that like we, we did move around up until much later, quite a bit. Like we were, if I was going to school, I would have been in a new, and I saw my older brother deal with this, right? I would have been in a new school every couple of years. Mm -hmm. because we are just moving. We moved from uh, Georgia to uh, California, then to Montana. And, and so I would have been through multiple different schools if I was homeschool or wasn't. And I think that that would have changed my experience in school drastically on how I, I wouldn't have had the, uh, the, the school experience that you see in movies, right? Where it's like, oh, I meet this, my friends that I met in, in like my mom still has the same friend that she's had since first grade. Yeah. That she went to school with and they still go get lunch and stuff like every Saturday. Right. And so I'm like, that's what I'm missing out on. If I'm not going to school, I'm missing out on these relationships. Right. Um, not, not really, you know, at this point, like, and, and at that time too, I think, um, I wanted, I, it's easier to go to college if you go through the normal high school education system. So that was an element that I think I went back and forth about wanting to go finish, in the regular way, just because then it would it would make it easier to get into a college. But um, at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to go to college for. For a while, it was film. And if you it's like, OK, I could name the three my three favorite filmmakers and all of them say college is a waste of time for film. So <laughs> I I it's hard to justify spending all that money or spending all of my parents, some of my parents money. Right. In that situation, probably. Um, or taking out loans to go get a degree that I think would become somewhat irrelevant. So like I had to balance and weigh all those things, balance the moving part. Um, uh, Hannah's dad's reaction was, I mean, because of how religious they are, his reaction was, this is the best case scenario. Because he knew that at the situation that we were in, that we were going to um, move our relationship forward before we had talked about getting married. I was just going to move out to North Carolina. Um, and so I think in his, uh, very like fundamental Christian views, it was like the best thing that could happen us getting married. So uh, yeah, yeah he, he was like, cause he could get rid of her out of his house. Cause she's not a, uh, <laughs> she's not a headache anymore. And, yeah. and that she was going to a family that loved and cared for her. Right. No, my family is Hannah's family. So, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. like we don't talk about Hannah's family because it's a bunch of dark shit. But Hannah is I'm so proud of her. She's an incredible oh. human being. But yeah, so it, with with that, he was he was absolutely fine with it. Um, but to go back to the to the question, and just finish it off. I I am so grateful that my dad and mom raised me to be a open thinker instead of indoctrinating me into anything. Because not only did that give me the confidence in my own ideas, but the things that I do spiritually believe in, I believe in because they're mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't told that if I didn't follow them, that um, I was going to go to eternal hellfire or something like that. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I guess my version, I don't really call it, 
God per se, because like I, that word is an interesting word for me. But, um, you know, like uh, having having the ability to come to that in like a loving way or my own way, instead of it being forced upon me to like figure it out has mm -hmm. definitely changed my relationship with it completely in my adulthood. It still so, makes you spiritual. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I think it's it's from that it, that really interesting place of finding it on my own. And it's kind of like similar to not that it's the Christianity aspect of it, but like similar to my dad's situation where he came through all this messed up shit and then he went to jail or to prison and he gets introduced to those things there. And this is like your way of learning, right? Your way of, of figuring out whether you call it a creator or whatever, um, your connection to that source spot, right? So it's like, I think it has to be personal. I don't know. That's my mm -hmm. own opinion. And I think not Ooh. having myself yeah. indoctrinated into it in the, in the same way gave me a personal relationship in it that I actually like treasure now. So. Yeah. It's uh, even, even people in, in some years, depending on the family that I was with, the indoctrination that was happening from that religion still makes a person pause. In my opinion, I think everyone that watches this video live or recorded, you know, you're, you can be, indoctrinated, not saying that that's a bad or a good thing, but then all of a sudden, because you're unique and you're not like anybody else and you're trying to find out not only who you are, but what this connection is with things that you don't understand, uh, you be, you, you, you're forced to go, you know, this doesn't apply to me. <laughs> <laughs> These things right. don't apply to me. And, you know, maybe some stuff over here apply to me. And what I think is very unique about us all growing and learning and evolving <clears throat> is things that used to apply to us at a certain time in our life no longer apply to us today. Yes. And so, you know, it, it, everyone's, me and Matt always have these conversations, deep, 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 deep conversations. Uh, me and Matt can talk about anything. And Yeah, we talk uh, for hours. <laughs> and not only do we talk for hours, but we have that relationship where, it synergistically is that mastermind. Again, a label and a title. But Matt and I will start talking and just go into a vortex of a higher and higher plane of, of things that we want to do and, and ideas that we have. We really got a great relationship and we play off each other very, very well. And, uh, you know, that that's one of the things that I, I have with Matthew that I don't have with my other two sons. They're They're... They're totally, um, you know, different thinkers in different ways, you know. <laughs> right. So I was joking when Matt said, you know, I, I he was saying the way he was, and I said, you know, you're 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 welcome, uh, but that <laughs> that was all. That was not me teaching him or sharing something with him. That was just genetic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, there's there's has some... the genes. <laughs> I, I, I do think that like genetically, I'm the most my father's son out of the three of us. But, oh, yeah. you know, I, I think that that just comes from, you know, me and my dad have had like a, a close relationship for like as long as I can remember. Like we've worked, I, I had built websites and sold websites with him when I was like 10, eight years old. So like I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I'm like, I can make money this way. OK, I'll keep doing it. Right. Buy video games as much I, as I, I would, want. I would challenge Matt. I would Matt. Matt and Kyle always wanted the newest updated computer, and there's me. I would constantly have the fastest internet that I could possibly pay for, and because I made money, it was always you know this big thick orange cable about the size of my thumb <laughs> that that comes from the closest point of presence, you know. Uh, and what, what's a, what's really amazing about that is that, uh, I would tell Matt, Matt said, well, you know, I wanted to get a new graphics card. I want to get a new computer. And it was always me saying that I would match him dollar for dollar. And then he's going, well, how am I going to make money? And, and so Matt at a very young age, uh, was calling companies and saying, Hey, listen, I'd like more information about your company. Do you have a website? And they would say, no. And then so Matt would wait a couple of days and call them back and ask them, he'd want more information about their company. And, and do they have a website? And they'd go, no. And then Matt would wait two days and he would 
find out a bunch of information about the company, create a website for them, and then call mm -hmm. them up and say, uh, I don't know if you'd be interested in a website, but I created one for you. Here's the address to go look at it. And I'd like you, I'd like to maintain it for you and sell it to you. <laughs> right. I got a lot of video wow. games that way. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that was, that was something that like, uh, you know, I being in front of the camera and stuff is not something that came to me naturally, but I definitely out, uh, I, I think like I'm so not anxious about it, I guess. I, I, I wasn't anxious about calling people back then either. I think like I, I really like my dad. This is something we share in common, focus on the outcome, not the way to get there as much. Like it, someone asked, it's like, uh, uh, when did you decide to really start listening to your dad and doing things the certain way? And That's I think- That's Katie, by the way, Katie Sanders. Thank yeah, you. Katie. Thank you, Katie. Um, when uh, it, it wasn't necessarily following the way that my dad said to do it, but to acknowledge that there were certain ways to do things and to find and seek those out was more of what I was taught. You know, if I was in the network marketing field and did did stuff in that area, I, I'd be listening to my dad's advice a thousand percent. The times that I was and did, it always worked. So I think um, it, worked, it worked for Hannah, too. It worked for Hannah too, right? Yeah. So <laughs> Hannah was 17 years old and she wanted her own car. Right. She and, did better than I did, actually. So yeah, that's why I was that, like, I gotta marry this girl. That and Hannah <laughs> were going back and forth for first place in the company. It was it right. pretty interesting. It was fun times. It was good times. Now you see um, documentation beats conversation, everybody, right here. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I, I it's funny because I kind of am like living proof of that in some ways. Yeah. Um, as far as the parenting aspect of it goes. But um with uh yeah, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions here. So I don't know if you guys want no, to no, no. Yeah, I was gonna say or do you want you want no, me to just read them off and answer? answer a couple of them? Let's yeah, let's get a few questions sure. under our belt because sure. I'm sure people would love to hear. Uh, for example, okay, first of all, you acknowledge Bob Johnson and uh, the right. other gentleman that asked the question about uh, how is Hannah's dad reaction to you guys? That was John mm -hmm. Tier. So thank you, Bob and John. Thank you guys. Thank you, Katie, for posing your question that Matt just uh, kind of went through. Uh, Lisa Marie Cook asks. Where does your true, where does your true passion, I guess, come from, and what is your vision? Um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, right? Like, um, my true passion and like vision, uh, even sometimes, like, if you wanted to go really far out, right? Um, I believe that we're like being raised in a in a house that's constantly like. What's the new technology? Let's utilize it, that type of stuff. And having that like excitement myself, and even taking, I'd say like much further, right? Like I'm into VR stuff and all this type of stuff. And um, I just truthfully see the world drastically changing over my lifetime from where it is now, um, whether it's artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, these types of things that are going to become more mainstream over the next couple of years, the new version of computing, basically. Um, my, my firm belief is that these will change not only how we interact, but it'll also change how we educate ourselves. And it'll change how we educate one another, right? And mm -hmm. I think being homeschooled, the thing that I had lacked um, won't exist for my children's generation, right? that you'll be able to be connected all the time. And that almost is the way that it is now, but a very in a very augmented or physical way. And the information that you'll be learning will be evergreen from the best and smartest people that could make it. Instead of, a, you know, if, if say that teacher doesn't care, or whatever, or you have a teacher that does care, but doesn't have the resources to teach, all of that stuff will evaporate. And as that happens, like I have a very very um, adamant thought lately that this is where I'm meant to be at this moment in time. Like all the work that I've done leading up to this point is to service that as that grows, I'm meant to be part of that. And so that's where my focus and vision has been lately um, on how these pieces of technology will change how we interact with one another. And I want to be part of 
shaping that and doing the best that I can to give it a positive impact uh, instead of a negative one. Because, you know, eventually there's going to be, in my opinion, eventually there will be a job title that is like just storyteller. Because what will end up happening is all the things, the barriers that stop you from doing that, stops you from making a movie, a video game, writing a book, making music, all of those things won't exist in the future. Those barriers will no longer exist. Um, AI will make it so you can basically make anything that you want, anything that you can imagine. And so I think that truthfully, there will be a whole group of people out there. They call them content creators now that will just tell stories with this new stuff. <laughs> So you're so, saying that the people that the people that love telling stories and are content creators, that the world is going to change for them to have everything at their point to be able to impact. I, it's not just going to be them. It's going to be everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I think that's the thing is that like the people right now that are creative are are thinking about these tools and thinking about the, it taking away their creativity in a way. Um, it's going to be the opposite, in my opinion. It's going to make it, it from the moment that the smartphone existed and all, any of us could record ourselves and upload it on the internet, it's drastically changed us as a human race. And the way that we process information, change information, um, trade information, all these things have changed drastically over the last decade of my life. And I think that that's just, just going to become even more so the case when the barriers between uh, all the other creative outlets don't exist. You'll have people that have always had that itch to make something um, that haven't because they know the amount of work and effort that it will take to get that done. You know, every single film that's made is a miracle in a way. Like it's so hard. It's like starting a business and then hoping it succeeds. And then that you, it's just a year plan. You, you hope it succeeds. And if it falters, you just lost everything. And I think when that, it's funny because you have all these film studios not signing with the Writers Guild and the Screen Actors Guild people, not realizing that these people that they're not signing, they're like, I, I want to utilize AI and eliminate these people, not realizing that when the AI gets good enough for them to do that, that the same people that they're, they're stopping are the people that are going to dethrone them. They're the people <laughs> that will actually destroy the studio system. Mm -hmm. Because once that barrier no longer exists for writers or actors or anything to play any character do anything you know if you could sit there and mocap yourself and be completely animated as any character imagine what that gives to an actor or imagine being able to put yourself in any scene or any set or anything and people Visually, are doing that already they're doing that already the cost to do those things and the production cost and time that is going to get thinner and thinner just like it did for making things with phones and i think as that exists as we're on a podcast right now on the internet 20 years ago, we would have never done this. And I don't know if like all of us would have been here doing this and you see people watching us and stuff. All of this stuff existed. And I'm sure a bunch of people would have been like, I would have never shot a video of myself. I would have never done this or that. I'm telling you with these new changes in technology, we're going to see such a influx of creativity in people, right? Because the barriers to that creativity will no longer be so vast, right? And I think as that happens, I just plan on trying to help not only other people do it, but like uh, be an advocate for it and do it myself, right? I think the way that we share information mostly is through stories. So I think um, the whole like edutainment thing will become more of the case. And I've seen that with YouTube. Like I said, I, I was raised more uh, instead of sitting down and I did this too, but instead of sitting down and reading a history book, why not watch someone that took the time to completely animate a whole history thing and teach it to you um, in a video form on YouTube in multiple parts. Like that's how um, the future of education will work. And it will be, like I said, so drastically different than the way that we do it now. So when I think about my future vision of not just for my, my own children in the future, but also my own impact. I think about that stuff. Like yeah. I really think about where that stuff's going. So yeah. I, I asked your mother if she had any questions for you, Matt. <laughs> oh yeah. And you want to guess what she asked? What? Who's the yeah. best driver? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> who's the say? best driver? At a, who's the oh. best driver? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that would be something she'd ask. Right. She said, 
ask him why he won't come see his mother. Oh my God. <laughs> the same reason. So, so listen, <laughs> listen, I, this is the part, this is the part of the call list that I, that I absolutely have. So my dad, my dad and mom do travel. That's true. At, at the same time, I, I was born and raised in a family of like homebodies. Like all of us like our own space. All of us like our own stuff. And so, you know, now that my parents are in Montana and I'm in California, I, I am experiencing that situation where it's like, uh, okay, I want to see them so bad, but then I have to leave like all of my stuff. I can't really work in the same way when I'm out there. So we'll definitely have to make it happen. That is funny though. That, that was their question. I, I we haven't I, been out there since February, so I, it's it's been a while I since throw, I've seen my parents. I will throw person. I will throw something back at you with that. Sure. I think that uh, you and Hannah, and of course your mom's not on the podcast, so she's not going to. She know can't it. defend herself. Yeah, <laughs> it's. Uh, I, I always think that if if the if the home bodies that raise the home body, that I think that we could all go someplace and do like we did the last time we went to Coeur d'Alene Lake. See, now we're talking. See? Yeah. So, so <laughs> everyone's on equal ground because we're as a family doing something where we don't want to be around our computers. Right. No, I think, I think that that's, that's like a perfect example, right? Like I would love to do something fun. I was born and raised pretty much in Billings, Montana, as much as I, love certain aspects of Montana. I'm not a fan of Billings, Montana. Um, so I don't miss it. I miss my parents. I don't miss <laughs> being there. So it's always like, hey, like you guys want to come out to California? Yeah, you what are go you do coming something? out to Cali? Yeah, right. right. No, I'm like, okay, we came in February. You guys could come out here. But exactly the same situation I said. My mom goes, I'd have to leave my dogs here. I'd have, I wouldn't have all my stuff. Like we're similar in that way. And I think yeah. we get that about one another, but at the same time, it doesn't make it any easier that distance, right? Like I, I miss going over to my parents' house all the time and hanging out with them. So, um, yeah, yeah we definitely have to make that happen. So <laughs> I just am so like, you know, all this shit lately. Me, me, I, me I don't know why I haven't, but me, me personally, my whole life with Matthew and also Kyle and even their mother, right. You know what I mean? Is, they never get to do this stuff to me because I'm like, okay, do you, I, I, I'm going to Budapest. You guys want to go with me? And, and it's like, <laughs> no, no, we don't want to go. And I go, okay, I'm, I'm going to Nigeria. Do you guys want to go with me? And they're like, no. And it's like, Hey, I'm going to the Philippines. Do you guys want to go with me? And it's like, no, no, thank you. So. It's, yeah. It's so funny too, because <laughs> like I do, I do love, I do love traveling, but I, man, the way my dad travels is like too energetic for me. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I think I, I don't know where he gets the energy from because like I'm, you know, 30 years younger, but I, I hope that I have as much energy as my dad does at 61. Cause like oh, I, thank you. when, when, whenever we do travel and you, all you have to say is, Hey, let's go somewhere and travel as a family. I'm like, absolutely. Because my dad is like one of the best people to travel with. Like every single time we go somewhere, he's like, what excursions are we doing? Why are we in the hotel room? Let's get out and go to a restaurant <laughs> or something. Or got, do it, something. got it. Got it all. Got it all lined up doing boards yeah. this day and wave runners this day and boat this day. And <laughs> it's like, yeah, like <laughs> I'll join you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Craig's Craig's family. So, yeah, definitely. um, okay. I've got a, a couple of other questions here. Sure. If I may, um, now real Please. quick, cause I, I know that, uh, Jer uh, Jerome has a really good question that I want to ask, but, uh, okay. we were talking about Hannah a little bit ago and I, I don't know if we really got, how the two of you met, if you want to share that. Sure. Uh, and Bob Johnson is asking that. And I know that mm -hmm. there's, there's backstory, but at the same time, I think it would be neat to see what it was that got the two of you together. Yeah. Well, I think the, like the whole situation of just me and um, me and Hannah had, like I said, a lot of similarities. We have like the same sense of humor. So it, it we became friends way before we started dating and way before, like when I say, oh, we started dating and then a month later we got married. I think a lot of people hear that and they think like, wow, that's crazy. But like we were talking every day 
like half a year before I went out there to see her. There we go. Right. Like just building our friendship. We weren't really like pushing it into that relationship territory till much later. So like, I think in a sense, because we built that friendship first and it, that has a lot to do with like the social media aspect. If yeah. I was around her, how pretty she is, I probably would have been a lot different. Connecting uh, like with that, others. Right. Yeah, Being able to, I, I don't to think about her. what I said too is totally different to how I am because like yeah. I very much. You can't say the wrong quick. thing to the right people. True. But one of the one of the things I think they might be getting at, Matt, is um, um, I hired Hannah's father to do programming for me for a back right. office called Unlimited Profits. And so when we were doing that, it was basically like an affiliate program, a multi-tier affiliate program for selling personal development. And so it was, you know, one of those crazy ideas where all the owners I work for were idiots. So I'm not that big of an idiot until I started that. And then I was also an idiot. So it's like, uh, <laughs> you, you, you don't know what you don't know. So Unlimited Profits taught Robert Hollis that he's not CEO material. I, I, I'm, I'm the person in the field. I'm the quarterback, not the owner of the team. And, and so when we put that company together and Hannah's father was programming it, of course, then he was part of that uh, company selling stuff. And so was Hannah. And so was Matt. So it wasn't right. long before... Of course, if you're introducing people what to do, I don't know if we use Zoom or what we used back then, but Google, Google Hangout, Google Hangout. So it was like me Skype. doing that. And then uh, apparently they said, well, you know, Matt and Hannah are the two youngest people that are on a Google Hangout. <laughs> it's like, no, that was always the case. Too, everybody you know, else like, was so much older than they were, you know, even. Even his brother, and you know, was probably my older. Group. Yeah, ten years older than me. Yeah, dark, ten years dark, older years. Than, than Matt and Hannah. So you know, so it was it. You know, and then all of a sudden, because of things that Hannah was doing, she was extremely motivated to get a car, and so the amount of contacts and the people that she was willing to fly through. Uh, you know, I remember uh, one of the months uh, she made like seven grand. Can you imagine making? Yeah. For those of you that are listening that we're not talking about that, but, you know, Hannah is one of those people that said, wait a minute, this guy's made a lot of money and I just got to find the right people at the right time and then put them in front of you. Uh, I'll do that. And by her doing that, you know, she made $7,000 one month and, and was able to go buy a car. And so mm -hmm. she was like one of the success stories that we had in the company. And that was at 17. Right. You know, so now, oh, yeah. Like, Hey, this, this girl's got some stuff going on. Plus she's like, I need to get to know her. <laughs> she's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. You know? So. Right. Yeah. So no, I mean, you just, you just gave the whole synopsis of it basically dad, you know? And I think through, through us both being the youngest, like obviously we could connect and like share um, in the beginning, share like strategies or share thoughts or, or ideas. And then that eventually, you know, you start joking with one another and then that eventually goes, so like, okay, we're kind of picking on each other and now we're flirting and now, so. It, I, it, it, I, think, I think it's funny, Matt, because, you know, storytellers are about their perception, right? Mm -hmm. And so if someone asked Matt, exactly how did you meet Hannah? And Matt could say, um, she was one of the top producers in a company that me and my father created. <laughs> yeah, you know? that... That that could be the case. Like I, you know, it's funny because it's almost like it's almost like job title in the same way. It's like I could give yeah, a different version every time. Yeah. Because it's like if if people ask me, they'll be like, "Hey, what do you do?" And it's like, "What do I not do?" Like, there's a lot of things that I do, right? So sometimes they'll be like, "I do graphic design work." Sometimes I'm web design. Sometimes I'm video editing. Sometimes I'm marketing strategy. Sometimes Matt, so. I, I, I'm sorry to get off track, but we're I, I just seen something that cracked me up. Uh, yes, no, please. And the guy said, ask this one guy, he's, he's a comedian and his name is Theo. And the guy goes, uh, he goes, um, um, he says, what are you doing right now? And he goes, opiates. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great response. I mean, I love that sense of humor thing. That's another, that's another part of who I am. Yeah. Right. Like, um, the part that, I don't think either one of my parents connect with me on is that love of like movies and stuff. And I, the more that I've tried to like pinpoint where that's from, I can't think of anybody else, but like my 
my grandma and my grandparents going out and like visiting them. My grandma, my mom's mom, um, like loves horror movies and like the messed up ones. Right. <laughs> Which you're like, she's a sweet Slasher, old lady. Right? I love my grandma. Yeah. Like Friday the 13th and stuff, yeah. a nightmare on Elm street. So me growing up watching my grandma, like love these horror movies and stuff. I have the same sense for stuff like that. And like, I really enjoy horror stuff i you know like i i've just it's just a part and on the other hand my mom is like i will not watch him I, she will not watch anything horror related and i don't think my dad really cares for it because where's the motivation in that no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> the motivation to survive no i'm just kidding yeah. oh <laughs> yeah. the the motivation is is not to to stop walking when the music changes in the movie <laughs> No, yeah, my dad's one of those people. I'm going into the garage he's... with the chainsaws hanging on. <laughs> it's like, where do I go? Right. What the, the car yeah. or the chain? Yeah, garage. that's the part if you I'm can't walking, <laughs> If I'm walking and the moves, moving, music changes, I'm turning the opposite way and running. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my God. That's funny, man. Okay. No, it I'm... is. I... Sorry. Go ahead, Craig. No, no another. Ahead. Another question uh, from Jerome Marshall. He was saying, okay, Matt, what is your three year plan for your life? I mean, I know that, you know, there's a lot of things that are here that right. are happening, but why not enlighten everybody what yeah, your three year I, plan is? Because I know you've shared it over these podcasts. I've got a, yeah, I've a got nutshell. a few, I've got a yeah. few things, right? Like I, I try to like give myself like a pie chart of like, 30, 30, 30, or whatever it has to be. Right. So I I've got things that I want to do personally. Me and Hannah would love to buy a house. I'd love to probably, I mean, possibly have a family. Hannah's three and a half years younger than me. So we're not like in a rush to do it, but we know that we want to. So it's like more so whenever that time or that moment hits for us. Um, so personally, that's something that I'm excited about, right? Like to mm -hmm. actually become a parent one day would be awesome. Um, and then as far as like what we're doing here to just grow, not just the Robert Hollis and the Hollis brand, but also to get in front of as many people as possible that need the information, you know, like I think YouTube has allowed us to do that more over the last year than, than before. And I think that that's just going to have exponential growth with the things that I'm talking about, because it will just give us the ability to be more creative with the ideas and the things that we're doing. So I see that continuing to grow and, and continuing to build. And then personally, I would love to, I would love, I, I think long-term, I would love to own a animation studio or a video game studio in the future. So I, when I think about myself growing up, I used to do stop motion animation when I was a kid, um, loved doing it. Then I did flash animation. Um, my one of the first couple of movies I remember seeing that really impacted me was like Toy Story and a Lion in the Lion King and mm -hmm. stuff. And I've always had a love for animation and Pixar and stuff. And when I was a kid, that's where I wanted to work. Right. Like I wanted to move to California and work at Pixar. So when I think about my upbringing now, I can see or the way that I am now, I think um, I could see myself having that because the problem with film is that I just. I love peace and quiet and I, not that I wouldn't do a film, but I, I, I very much am an iterative person by nature. And so I think that leans more into computers and game and, and animation where I can go to office every day, come home to my family. Um, and then when, yes. you know, when I ship something, I still go home and it, there's no difference for me. I don't, the thing that I've always struggled with, with stepping into the film world is this whole, like, I have to be gone for months at a time. My focus has to be completely over there. Um, the movie comes out. Now I'm gone even longer to go promote the film. How do you have a healthy family life around that? That's something that I've always struggled with, right? Because I do want to have a family. I do want to be around my children. I don't want to want them to just know of me, right? So I think that that's something that three years from now, I would love to, love to have something like that going, you know? And I'm working on that stuff now. I think as the uh, Apple headset, VR, AR headset comes out, 
And as um, Meta keeps coming out with more stuff and Samsung's got stuff, I think that the new version of spatial computing will just kick off. And I want, I want to be involved in that world like I would have been if the smartphone were to come out when I was an adult, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm seeing all this technology and you see all these people that have made Billions are have changed the world through the app store and that the app store made that all possible. Things like Uber and stuff couldn't have existed without the app store and um, smartphones in the same way. And I think that there's going to be a whole new resurgence of all kinds of things that you have not thought of um, in this new area and realm, especially in augmented reality. And so I would love to own a company that was building those things, whether it's storytelling to... Um, get points across similar to film and take the things that I know and love about film and just use them in this new area. Right. And I said this to my dad the other day, it's like, I could take all the skills that I have and I've developed and go into film, which is not, it's not an old art form, but it's also not a new art form and utilize them. And then I'd be playing by the rules of the playbook that has been invented up to this point. And there's certain things you can do, but most have been done. If you if you watch enough films, you know that most films are more calls to other films and into storytelling in general than it's even new, right? You see these replications of shots. You see these replications of performances. You see these replications of all of this stuff. And not that that's a bad thing because I think stories are timeless, but I see this new area becoming developed that I really can play around with and nobody really knows how to do this process. So it's like exciting to me because telling a story where you're in it in virtual reality, um, if you've experienced it and in its infancy as it is now, um, I can't imagine how it would feel to experience a story being in it where it's, it's, it's actually as deep as something like Goodwill Hunting or something. And I do believe that these experiences can change people just like film has, you know, like imagine somebody that's gone through a struggle, like something like 12 Years a Slave, except you get to experience that in, in a way that more is, um, you're more present in it. And I think movie theaters have this, um, right now and that's on its way out unfortunately but like this whole communal watching something and we're all going to pay attention to it and give it our full attention but i've watched as social media and things have grown that now the way that people consume movies and television is like as a second screen experience mm -hmm. you're you're talking right now what i like to say is the star trek phenomenon the hollow deck it, yeah, the moment us. that VR comes back that or becomes big, and you've already seen this in Apple's presentation, right. the moment now we're fully paying attention again to what we're experiencing. And it's hijacking our senses enough that we're no longer going, oh, man, like I need to see what people are doing on social media. And I'm excited right. for that transition back in storytelling because I think And it's that, happening around you 360. Right. No, totally. basically 100%. Oh, it, it's, it's good enough. It's good enough to keep your attention. There's enough stimulation going around where you get immersed in it instead of just a sound bite or. You know. Yeah. And then there's actual first person storytelling where you're actually the character. I wouldn't do that with something like 12 Years a Slave because I don't think that's a good idea. But I think, um, you know, there's certain aspects where a, if someone's dealing with something, right? or has gone through something, you can really put them in a character's shoes just like you can in a film and get them to experience a similar outcome. They do this even in some forms of therapy. So I can't imagine what this technology is going to do for people that have PTSD. I can't imagine what this technology is gonna do for people that have dealt with traumatic events, for people to understand things from people that have gone through things. Um, I think, it's the great equalizer in a way of like uh, the internet's already been this way, but like, man, when you, when you're in a place where kind of everybody is somewhat anonymous, everyone can look and be who they are completely. We've seen that with the internet and I'm, I'm curious to see what that becomes when it's completely three-dimensional, you know, like they call it internet 2.0 or like the three-dimensional internet or spatial computing for a reason. And that is because, we're talking about an experience where your your full senses are are 
being utilized. Kind of like if you go went to an IMAX theater, except if you turned around, it's still there, right? Right. It's not just seats <laughs> back there. Yeah. Ready Player One is another one that is. Yeah, uh, no, Ready Player One is a good example of, too. Yeah. I mean, that's metaverse basically. And I, I don't know where that will go. We'll see. You know, I know like a lot of people are like, well, I wonder if we'll live on the metaverse and stuff. And as that stuff was coming out, I was more of an advocate for it. But I really think that, um, you know, if you wanted to go really far into the future, I think anytime you try to commercialize something, you're you're stunting its growth drastically in mm -hmm. a way. And the moment that Meta started commercializing the metaverse, I don't think I think that that took all the wind out of its sails of coming anytime soon. Wow. Because most people are not, they're like, I don't want to be part of that. You know what I mean? Like, I want something that's open. The internet grew as an open platform, and the new version of the internet will grow as an open platform. So, <clears throat> well, I got a, I got one last question for you. <laughs> sure. Okay. I know that was a long rant, but that is no, that's the, my vision. No, not I, at all. I, uh, when you interview somebody, the goal is to get to know who they are, what they think, what they believe, where they're going. And, and, uh, so what is something that you would think that a lot of people don't know about Matthew that you think they would just go serious? <laughs> yeah. What, what is, I mean, what is something that people don't know about you that, that I think that they would be just, yeah, it's freaking, I mean, away. I, you know, it depends on where you want to go with it because I, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm pretty open about a lot of things. So like I'm open that I, I read, I think people would be in, uh, they'd be curious about the amount of, of things that I do read or the topics that are interesting to me. Um, if I, I could just rattle off like a bunch of, of creative people that I follow and you'd go, okay, like, Stanley Kubrick, Stephen King, some of these other people, um, huge fans of their work and stuff like that. So I think that's something people already know about me to a certain extent. They just don't know what I what I tend to like consume. Um, I I still and always will play video games like a lot. I one of the I remember telling my mom when I was like fourteen or fifteen. I'm like, if I, I'll never get married if she doesn't play video games. That's not true. She didn't when I met her, but this is her computer here. And <laughs> but I, I didn't force her to do it. She, she loves to play video games too, but like that's, that's been a part of my life for a long time. I've played all kinds of social games. The one that I've played a lot and some people might know is like world of Warcraft. If you've heard of it and it's destroyed your family's life or somebody else's family that you know, then you know of it. But it's like an online game that um, that's very social. Like you talk to people and I've been playing this game for like six, I think it's been out for 15 or 16 years. So I've been playing it since I was a young teenager. Um, two of my best friends that I've had since I was a teenager that I just was hanging out with yesterday, still my friends, still talk to them all the time because of that game. I used to run a guild or a clan so it's like a it's like a company <laughs> right and we all have like a similar ob objective so when i was 16 17 years old i would get on this video game and lead 40 people to victory like every weekend you were the ring in raids i was the raid leader yeah and i ran the guild too so i that element you know one thing that people don't know about me is that that video game not only meeting the social people that i did on it but the way that it taught me to lead people and the way that it taught me to understand people are still things that i use to this day the fact that you can't use that shit on a resume is pretty interesting because i i both my friends work in it and they're both um great at it and they're both they both have leadership skills because of the game too i feel like so it's like that's probably the most well-known non-known thing about me is that I, I, a I'm, lot of I'm that. Gonna, so. I'm going to bring up one that you bring up to me every once in a while, just to sure. out you out, just to out you a little bit. <laughs> oh, please. please. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, one of Matt's, uh, unknown qualities, uh, is that, um, you know, his kind of storytelling and these are his words, not my words. But but 
the the stories that he would love one day to entertain with people to sort of f up their brain is is right. are, are really 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 dark. <laughs> and, right. Well, um, I yeah. And I just think that I, I just wanted to, you to the you don't have to say anything about it, but he's waiting for the moment of people that believe they really know who Matt is. And then when he gets known for the kind of content that he would love to create, that he finds he finds most passionate, he's always thought in his mind, you know, these people are going to go, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because like, I'm such, I try, I try and I am as a person, like such a nice, and me and Craig were talking about like, uh, chivalry <laughs> before this, right? Exactly. I'll hold the door open yeah. for everybody. Uh, if you're around me and you're a woman, the chair is being pulled out uh, for you. The doors are always being opened, everything. That's how I was raised. Um, it, you know, it's just the way that I am. And so as far as storytelling goes, like it's just more, like I said, I could blame my grandma. I was, I, I, could, <laughs> I could blame my parents too, because there was never, this is an interesting part about me. My parents and my grandparents, because I didn't know my, my dad's parents really at all. Um, so just my mom's parents, no one ever stopped me from consuming anything that I wanted to. So I was allowed to watch horror films when I was six, seven, eight years old. They didn't give me nightmares. I like enjoyed watching them. You might go, wow, that's how you make a serial killer. It's like, it's the opposite. <laughs> effect, <right? laughs> I'm like such a nice person that like, I can't hurt a fly. But, um, but with like, uh, with those stories and stuff, I think it just culminated in the things that I liked the most. Like I said, I my favorite films tend to be like, uh, uh, you know, I like the good, the bad and the ugly and stuff because of my grandfather. He was a cowboy at heart. So like I love all those Westerns that I watched with him. Um, horror films. My favorite film currently is like The Shining. I've, mm. I've loved The Shining for so long. I love the book and I love the movie. So if you've seen The Shining, then you kind of know like the type of movies that I would like to make. <laughs> the type Johnny. of stories, right? <laughs> and so I, you know, I admire I admire people that can that can show like uh, I love suspense. I don't know. I love suspense. Yeah. I love thrillers. I love horror. I tend to like sitting on the edge of my seat. I tend to like feeling uncomfortable. If a piece of art can make me feel that way, then it's like done a great job. So I. I um, have learned to love romance movies a lot more since I've been married and in love. So I love those movies. I could see myself making something like that nowadays too. So it's not, I don't know. I don't only want to make dark things, but. Matt, Matt, the only reason I wanted to pull that out of you is I thought if, if that would be at least something we could get on an interview where down the road, when, when you, when you do surprise <laughs> people, uh, they go, well, I didn't know this. And they go, well, apparently you didn't watch the interview. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, it, it's, I, I, I'd i say uh, another another thing that people don't know about me is like, I, I live in Southern California. My address, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, the, <laughs> the cool part about living here is, you know, over the last maybe like six or eight years of my life, um, I've never really been like into any alcohol or or uh, drugs or anything like that, really. Um, but weed, man, weed's great. So that's another part <laughs> that people don't know about me is that I, I am a 420 friendly person. So. <laughs> now, now, if you guys were wondering if she got anything from his, from his mother, uh, right? You, you see the tats all. My over mom's him. got a weed tattoo, so like. Yeah. I, <laughs> It's funny because my dad is like so not in any any way, but like me and my mom have always man, my mom is co is cool with the weed stuff. That's for sure. So I think as as things go, people, I don't know if that would surprise people because I'm I am the way that I am. But I think eh, people tend to I don't know people tend to think that if you um, partake in things like that, that it makes you stupid. So right. I. I, I think if you partake in it 24 seven, it probably makes you pretty stupid. But <laughs> I, if, if you're looking at me and going, uh, going, wow, he might have it together. I do also smoke weed and have it together. So I, I can be an advocate what, for that. What do you, what do you think of mushrooms? 
Mushrooms are the best. <laughs> Look out, Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully California at some point. No, I mean, I, you know, any, I'm, I'm a huge advocate going back to the analytical aspect. I really wasn't, um, you know, I really wasn't for any of these, any of these things when I was younger and I didn't partake in them till I was of age too. Mm -hmm. Like I, um, uh, even drinking, I really didn't do anything, but with mushrooms and, and, uh, psychedelics and pr as a uh, outcome for like growth, I think that they're one of the best things that exist. And it changed me a lot as a person, my, uh, situations with them, you know, and I think some people get high or they'll take edibles, even weed edibles, and they'll do that to have fun. And I'm not, not one of those people. But I think that drugs like marijuana and um, psilocybin, which is in mushrooms, I've, ne I've never done LSD or anything like that. That shit kind of scares me. But, um, you know, stuff from the earth, my, like mushrooms and like marijuana, I, and I know that the outcome can't be bad in a sense. Like I, I, that's something that always worries me about alcohol is like that I, bad outcomes can happen with al alcohol. So, um, I'm an advocate for those things because I think they help you grow as a person. You take and, a practical approach to this. And yeah. an adult approach. An adult approach. Way. That's better. That's <laughs> I, better I, to I, would never, I would never advocate for a, a kid to do any of these things because truthfully, going back to the analytical side, I, I, when your prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed, you probably shouldn't be smoking marijuana. That might hurt that. And it can actually like affect things. So it, it's good to be serious about it because I know certain people out there are like, weed is the best. Like everyone should smoke weed. No, smoke weed if you feel like it. And if it makes you anxious and you don't like it, don't do it. Like there's no big outcome flip that's going to happen for you where you're going to go, oh, okay, this works. Um, I, 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 it's I, where you are. I, I get high and I think I'm going to die. And I'm not a poet. <laughs> right. I'm not a poet and I didn't even know it. It's like, it's like <laughs> Yeah. So that's, that's, that's something that I would say. I would say, you know, be, be cautious with yourself, but also be open to exploring yourself when I'm in those situations that I know that I can't be hurt, but my mind is expanded. I like to meditate and think on things in those areas. And um, I love this quote, not that I really follow him too much anymore, but Joe Rogan had this good quote about weed where he said, you know, the only thing that marijuana does is like enhance your, your, the things you're already thinking about. So if you're thinking about things that are futuristic or you're thinking about, uh, you know, philosophy or these things, we can really help eliminate like the, the barriers between you finding some of those pieces of information. The other hand, if you're in an anxious place in your life or you're going through things, which I've experienced this too with marijuana, it's only going to make that anxiety worse. It's only going to heighten those things because it heightens what place you're already in. So, and mushrooms are like a totally different experience. I would do research. Everybody should do research before they do that. But um, mushrooms are great because they, they really, I was not a, uh, a spiritual person at all until I did mushrooms. Wow. So interesting. When I did mushrooms, it really that, changed. That sounds, that sounds like a formula to build a church around right there. <laughs> it, it has been. People have done it, right? I, I, but, think like, I think for some people that watch this video, they go, dude, you're way late on, on that train. <laughs> right. No, yeah. I mean, it. It. I, I think that it expands your mind if you're open to it. And mushrooms are one of those things that I think should be legalized, psilocybin in specific. I think the amount of research and science behind it helping people, both with ego death, mortality, uh, anxiety. I, I can tell you that before I took it, before I took about took it, I really felt, and I haven't in years, but I really felt like I didn't, I felt like I didn't really belong here. Right. And it was like, almost like this hug from like, nature mother earth god whatever you want to call it going like no everything is as it should be your human mind is what's making this so complex and that feeling had changed who i was because before i 
the complexity of everything frightened me. Not knowing certain things frightened me. But now I'm so much more like at ease. And I've seen this in people that are spiritual or really spiritual. There's like this at ease that I wish I, I would have pre this um, incident of just going, everything's going to be okay. Right. And you see that in people that believe they'll go, everything's going to be okay. I know it's going to be fine. And I just didn't have that. Like I didn't. Wow. And, That's and deep. once That's I had done that, yeah, once I did mushrooms, then I was like, oh, okay, there's, there's something here that's telling me everything's going to be fine. Like, I'll be okay. Death isn't me, something I really need instead, to be worried about. I, right. Go ahead. Yeah, for me, instead of mushrooms, it was just trauma for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's different. It's different for everybody. You know, like I think that's why people do ayahuasca and that stuff in general is like, it can be, um, there's a lot of research with these, these things, um, ketamine or whatever that they're doing therapies even out here in California for PTSD and, and military people and people that have experienced heavy trauma. Um, there's this book, uh, um, the body keeps score. It's, it's a great book on mental health. And if you haven't read it or listened to it, it's really good if you want to understand the human mind, because it's one of the best people on it. Um, someone that's done many studies on medication, on different methods, on these, um, drugs and stuff. And it's like, if it, his whole ideology is if we could replace medication with some of these treatments, I think it would be better on the human body because it would have less side effects. Wow. But a lot of people would say that that's the reason why it's not legal, right? Is because you have to sell the medication and the medication right. has side effects. So then you need medication for the side effects. <laughs> but, um, but no, I'm an advocate for those things. I'm an advocate for trying to find your own perspective on life, you know, and I, I, that's, that would be my lasting like uh, thing is just like, try to seek that out for yourself. Stop like letting other people tell you what that is. Right? right. Like learn from them. Don't say, no, you're wrong. Observe them, be an observer of life, but don't be a judge, judger of it. Right. Like just relax, I guess. Well, man, what a great interview. You got anything <laughs> else, Greg? No, I, I don't. I mean, just, uh, it's it's such a pleasure, Matt, to yeah. get to know more about you. I know we, you know, the three of us work together <laughs> fairly closely, but to even go further, and I know a little bit of the history with, you know, uh, since I've known your dad, but to go into more depth and to find out more about you uh, is is just so enlightening. It really Not is. Thanks. And to see your perspective, especially, you know, as we have been doing these podcasts, it's like, okay, where does he come with this? Where, where did he get this idea? Yeah, no, I, I more than just being right. the son of your dad. Exactly. No, I, I honestly feel like, um, you know, after we did your interview last, I'm like, this is exactly what we we're supposed to be doing. I was, that's why I came into this excited and not really nervous. Right. Is I, I think if, if there's one thing that we all do, it's like bounce off each other and mastermind about topics with this. Yes. But it is really interesting, just like you just said, to figure out where those topics come from in that yeah. person. And my dad is on every day. So it's like a lot of people know his story. They know those things about him. But then it's like, hey, well, what where's Craig come from? What's what's Matt's thoughts? Like, why are they sharing things in these ways? So you just so, talked about you just talked about why I don't need to do an interview. <laughs> I mean, I think the the interesting thing is, is that I don't think that there's two people out there that would know the, the right questions to ask you more than me and Craig. That's yeah. true. Because we know the questions that no one else would ask you, you know, right. and I think if we did end up doing an interview with you, that would probably be more the case, right? Like those, yeah. those mm -hmm. pockets of, of information and wisdom that you have that you really kind of only share um, with your inner circle or the people that are close to you. Right. Right. And, and that's the thing. The closer you are to my dad, the more of that free thinking stuff is going <laughs> to seep into you. Because just like the podcast is called, How Do You Know That? Like, um, that's something that I, it's so interesting that I'm doing an interview on a podcast named this when my dad has been saying that to me since I was a, a, as long as I can remember. So it is, it is actually like really, that is, that is crazy what you just said. Yeah. It, yeah. It's really crazy to, to be here and it's so humbling for me. And I'm like so proud of my dad for the things that he's accomplished. Thank so you. proud of the things that, 
me and Craig and all three of us have accomplished together. I'm so happy to have met you, Craig, and to have built a friendship with you and to continue to do that through the years. So thank you guys so much for having me on and asking me questions, you know? Awesome. 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 I love you, son. Thank you for doing this. Love and appreciate both you guys. So with that said, there's a lot of people out there that if we said, Hey, we're going to have you on a hour and 45 minute podcast telling you about, you know, interviewing (laughs) your whole life. I think there's a lot of people out there would say that isn't (laughs) happening. That's not going to happen. Right. No, I mean, and then there's some people out there that probably would be like, do you have four hours? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so let's pick so, your so brain. Cute. Right. Yeah. Well, great. Matthew, Close this out. Close this out. Yeah. I, I, the, I, I, there's nothing else I can follow up with except Matthew. Thank you so very much for being so open to everybody and to all of us. We appreciate you and just can't wait to keep moving forward with you and your dad. Thank so. you so much, Craig. Um, you can all, ladies and gentlemen, you can follow Robert Hollis at roberthollis.com. You can also follow Robert on YouTube at roberthollis.com forward slash YouTube. On Discord at roberthollis.com forward slash Discord. On Instagram at instagram.com forward slash official Robert Hollis. On TikTok at tiktok.com forward slash at sign real Robert Hollis. Uh, please don't forget to like and share this video on YouTube and share with others. It's going to help us grow our community and reach those with ears to hear. Our schedule is uh, Sunday through Friday, 12 p.m. Pacific, going live. Robert goes live every day with his thoughts, his wisdom, his guidance to share with everyone. Then on Saturdays, it's Ask Me Anything, starting at noon Pacific. And, of course, we have today, the How Do You Know That podcast, Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific. And then when you do join the Inner Circle, you're going to be able to be part of the Inner Circle Breakthrough Sessions, which take place every Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific, where we go into depth. We take a deeper dive into what's holding us back and to help you get to the next level. Matt, as our executive producer and just a dear friend and a fellow visionary, thank you so very, very much. What a great interview. And of course, Robert, bless you, man. Thank you for putting this, uh, helping to put this all together and for allowing us to be a part of this amazing journey that we are all taking together. And thank you for joining us. Craig Jackman here. Thank you again. Please be good to yourself. Be cash. And until next time. <laughs>